Yes. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of uh, Parker Office Hours. Uh, we uh, have a community doc. You can check it out, and you will uh, find our code of conduct in there. So the rules apply. Uh, but as such, the rules just be uh, nice to each other. And today we have a couple of agenda items, and uh, maybe I should start with them. Uh, I will just like uh, I would like to announce uh, the new releases of Parka. We last week we released two versions, uh, 1.7 for Parka and no 0.7 for Parka and 0.4 for Parka Agent. Yeah, like, uh, version one. This is just overrated, so we keep uh, 0. Point version. So like you can find the links in the doc, and uh, we have a couple of highlighted items for Parka, uh, like. Besides some uh, dependency updates, we just completely removed profile trees. And for Parka Agent, uh, the most significant one is we now support the C Group version 2 completely. So check it out, our uh, release versions. I try to deploy them and give us feedback. Uh, we really appreciate those. Uh, with that being said, I guess the first agenda item is from Frederick. He would like to discuss the new uh, columnar storage layout and the design. So Frederick, you can take it away. All right, awesome. <clears throat> so a little bit of context for this. Um, as uh, Kimai kind of started with in um, Parka 0.7, we actually removed what was formerly our very first version of the Parka storage where we stored um, profiling data essentially in in flame graphs, if you will, um, because essentially it was exactly the same representation that we needed to, to render flame graphs. And the idea was storing the data in the way that we're going to visualize it later, uh, hopefully would make things faster. But it turns out for that only ended up being the case for a very small minority of queries. And there were, were more and more queries that we realized we want to do efficiently that um, became much slower by storing it in trees. And so um, we're now essentially storing, uh, and this is kind of what um, Parka 0.7 does as well. We're storing essentially um, a series of stack traces. And uh, that happens basically in similar to what we know from Prometheus time series. So in, in our heads, what we can the way that we can think about this is that we have a time series for every stack trace that we've ever seen um, attached with uh, workload labels. So I don't know, in Kubernetes, let's say namespace, pod, container, maybe even container ID, um, and then the stack trace. And uh let me um give the introduction and then we can already get take a couple of questions and then we can discuss the um the the proposal further i would say um <clears throat> the 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 big problem uh, that you may already see here is that um essentially we we are attaching ids as sort of as labels introducing ids into the cardinality of uh, time series. And as we know, this is kind of an anti-pattern in Prometheus. And we were trying to see how far we can actually push this, but it turns out um, there is uh, there is a there's a limit to it. And so we were have been exploring ideas of how we could not have that kind of cardinality restriction. Um, as well as serve other purposes where time series may be less suitable, um, such as like short-lived um, short workloads or serverless workloads or things like CI runs so that we could take uh, profiling data from CI runs. So that is essentially the, the setup that we had found ourselves in and um, the solution that we want to explore to solve this is a columnar storage. Uh, so that's kind of the setup of the whole thing. Um, I think Michael had a question already. Yeah, so I have to admit, I am not deeply familiar with the current design or code base at all. I'm, I'm more from the end user perspective, like 
I, I, I use it. Um, but I'm wondering if, how to phrase it properly. Parker has been, or the overall design has been certainly influenced by Prometheus or a lesson learned from Prometheus. You can think about service discovery and other things, labels. Um, and one lesson learned with Prometheus, if you like fast forward, not 2016 or 17, but now what you see is essentially this development that you have essentially more or less small stateless agents in the cluster that essentially just scrape and then remote write into something uh, rather than having big fat in cluster Prometheus, right? And I'm wondering, and, and again, I, a, I'm not an, an expert in that space to talk about you know pros and cons here, but I'm wondering if the lessons learned in the Prometheus setup, and, and, and again, I, I find the design, you know, the Prometheus design decision that, you know, it's not a distributed system per se. That's great. It's not a criticism. It's really just what can we learn from these decisions and this development where it led us to, you know, things like Cortex and Panos, et cetera, et cetera. That's my, my main question there, I guess. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a great question. So <clears throat> uh, actually, we, we did think about this from the very beginning with Parka and the way that the, uh, that the Parka server actually works is that um, it had it does already have a push API, um, so uh, that's what the Parka agent actually uses to communicate data to um, the Parka server, and the scraper that is built into the uh, Parka server actually internally uses that same gRPC interface, and so it's actually just a matter of um, releasing another binary that only does the scraping and does a, an H, a gRPC request against the storage to have the same kind of setup. And it's something that we've been thinking about as well um, to release the separate binary, just haven't do, done it yet. But 100% agree, um, this is something that uh, we want to do. Makes sense, thank you. And just <laughs> kind of taking the Parka um, maintainer hat off and Polar Signals um, employee hat on. Obviously, we're very interested in having that mode for a hosted product, right? Um, so that people don't have to think about or worry about maintaining a, maintaining a storage themselves um, and just use our product. Right, right. And, and to be brutally honest and transparent, that's exactly you know myself thinking two steps ahead. Um, if there were some managed service and, you know, uh, there are a few larger on-premises deployment, like the employer where I work, where, um, you know, there might be a managed service around that, then having this API and having something that um, you can standardize against is obviously beneficial. 100% makes sense. Yeah, agreed. All right, so with that said, um, let me, share my screen or share share my tab with this document. And <clears throat> I kind of went over the abstract and the, the problem at hand um, already. Um, so also feel free to interrupt me at any, any point when you know I'm going into too much detail and we can just skip over things. Um, I don't know how how interesting each and every you know column, and uh, their encoding is interesting. But um, I think just comparing it to the Prometheus world, um, we, we obviously still want to retain that, um, that way of querying data in Parka to be as similar as possible to the Prometheus world, right? That's where Parka was born. And from at least from a query perspective, we want to continue to retain that so that we have effectively that um, correlation experience um, without, you know, being a cloud provider that has all the products built already. We can integrate with the open source community here. Um, but I think the one thing that uh, took us a while to understand how to translate the Prometheus model into a columnar store um, where we don't necessarily have an inverted index to point to a series ID. The way that it works in a columnar store is that we have a set of columns that um, are dynamically added as we see 
let's say, let, taking the Prometheus example, as we see a label name for the first time, we uh, dynamically create that column. And then we use a um, combination of a dictionary as well as a run length encoding to say how, how many rows have the same value. And that way we can um, deduplicate the, the data a whole lot uh, once with a dictionary encoding. So we're all only going to save the same string um, once. And then using the run length encoding, we can say um, how many rows in a row um, have the same value. And it's not identical uh, to, to, the, to an inverted index, but at the end, by, uh, by scanning that table, um, we, we get the same experience. And um, as I said, I won't go into every single detail, but effectively, all the data that is in a single profile is then inserted into this table. Um, and each individual stack trace of a profile is individually inserted into the table. Uh, primarily, and this will be a follow-up uh, RFC, um, what we want to be able to do is actually not just query profiling data based on the application workload labels, but really down to the stack trace. And the reason why this is interesting is that that, that way we can then do queries like uh, searching for a function name as opposed to just saying, I'm interested in this um, pod or something like that, right? Uh, so these are kind of two ways of um, allowing people to search for um, the profiling data that they're interested in. Just giving a single example here, uh, something that we've started doing is we attach function names uh, to our tracing data. And that way, when we have a span that um, is slower than we um, expect, we can use that function to immediately search the data um, the, the profiling data that we're interested in, meaning only those that contain stack traces with that function. And then we, of all time that we've ever seen this function, we can see the CPU time spent in it. Um, so we don't necessarily even have to have profiling data from that one time that the um, trace caught, but of all time ever, uh, ever seen. Uh, Michael, raise his hand. Go ahead. Um, maybe you're getting to that, or uh, if so, then just let me know. Um, you had at the very bottom, you had this alternatives, and, and I'm, I'm, I remember a conversation where where charity approves. You know, you have you have to have your own database, or you have to write your own data store. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm just trying to understand if you really, 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 really have to write your own data store because that's as you know a huge commitment and it's like it will take a lot of effort and if i look through the the alternatives that you mentioned there uh sure yeah these are two and these are obvious ones but you know there are like if one would invest a little bit more time and i'm, I'm you know happy to to contribute to that effort to if you if you want to go down that route to have a serious look at other alternatives because I guess you have to ask yourself, where is your unique selling point here? And if it's the data store, fine, right? I, I think it's more in the, the correlation and integration where you say like, you know, consistent you know, like labels, for example, that allow you to correlate things with other signal types, et cetera. But um, yeah, that, that's maybe on a, on a not so deep dive design, my, my high, level, high level thought from what I've seen so far. Yeah. I. I, I completely agree with you. Um, uh, but yeah, it is something that we actually, <clears throat> giving a little bit more context also, we have been working on this RFC for a while um, internally. And just today, we copied all of it over, and there was a much larger alternative section. And actually, we've gone through several iterations of this RFC, where we now have two abandoned RFCs um, until we got to this point. So it's it's kind of a, a year and a half of experience trying to solve this okay. problem that led us okay. to this point. Okay. 
I, I would just suggest that to, to make that super clear, right? To say like, to essentially say what you just said, right? It's like, yeah. we had a look at that internally and you know, that's fine. Then why even bother listing these two, right? Because others would probably also look at that. It's like, ah, oh, you only looked at these other two others. What's what's wrong with you folks? Why do you have to have that? And it makes a lot of sense to, to have, don't get me wrong, right? I, I do believe that it makes a lot of sense. It's really just, if there is a chance to, you know, piggyback on someone else's work and reuse something, um, but yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I hundred percent agreed. And uh, to be entirely open also for the Polar Signals product, we may end up going a different route. It's um, more for the, like our, our first and foremost goal here is to have Parka, the open source project, provide a similar experience as Prometheus stuff does with the single statically linked binary that is incredibly easy to use and get started with. So. The product side is is a different RFC that is that happens uh, internally, but um, yeah, it, it's it's very possible that we might not use the the exact same data store internally. Um, that's like also being entirely transparent there, not even decided. So um, yeah, but really valid questions. Thank you for asking. Um, so yeah, uh, we we left off at. Um, the way that we encode um, labels in this in this scheme, and I think even more importantly than how we encode the labels is um, and the other uh, columns is that the way that we um, end up storing this data, and really key to making this uh, storage work. And I realize uh, Michael said something somewhat contrary to this, but making it somewhat manageable in complexity is uh, by sorting all like pre pre sorting all of this data all the time this means that um, we can have a really simple index of data where we don't actually index everything all the time but we can have a sparse index which is something that actually um, i think I, at least i haven't seen it anywhere else clickhouse kind of pioneered um, it's very possible that they also stole it from somewhere else but having sorted data allows us to not index every single row um, like it would happen in a relational database management system, but we can index only portions of data. Um, because it's going to be sorted, that means that just scanning a little bit too much data is actually not that big of a deal um, because we can just, in the query engine, um, like throw away that data. And it turns out, Hardware is actually made to work in, or not made, but it, it's actually faster if you if we work in batches. Just a general performance wisdom. Um, so it, it turns out that this is a pretty common approach uh, taken by columnar stores. So yeah, uh, this is definitely really specific to the data that we are going to be storing. So we. We can't necessarily look at this as a general purpose columnar store, but more of a columnar store um, specific to profiling data. That said, it probably a lot of the problems translate to other observability data. Um, but that begs the question: if all of the data has to be sorted, how does that happen at insertion time? And the short answer is. We just insert it in the right place. Um, the long answer is uh, we need to do a specific strategy based on each column's um, encoding. And with this, uh, I'm not going to dive into every single detail, but um, essentially, as I said, we always store data in batches and we always um, read those batches. And we just took the same naming that uh, ClickHouse does here, which is called a granule. So we are never going to going to store more than a configurable size of rows um, in one block, essentially. Um, and if we, in this case, I have the case where we have a granule that is five, seven, eight, nine. And if we now wanted to insert um, into this granule a six, it would mean that we need to now split up the granule into 
two granules, at least that's the strategy that we've chosen to start with. Um, and then we insert um, the, the new row at the appropriate place. Um, and because um, of because of because we're just splitting the granule in two, um, it means we also all only have to add a single entry into the index. Um, and while we do all of this, the index actually still stays true um, because it is all in order. And so queries are actually unaffected by um, by insert inserts. Um, only once an insert is complete, um, the the index is potentially going to be even faster. That's kind of the strategy on a high level. So yeah, um, that is um, that is on a very high level the way that we intend to um, implement this. That said, we have other than having worked uh, several years with the Prometheus storage and Thanos and Cortex. This is the first time we're actually implementing a columnar store. A lot of concepts are incredibly similar and they translate super well, um, but uh, we haven't actually done this. So uh, we'd love any kind of feedback from people who have. Um, and the last thing that I'll say um, is that obviously this is only a building block of the Parker project. Um, and the next thing that is essentially going to make use of this data is our query engine, which there will be a follow-up RC um, about this. But the kind of interface between the storage and the query layer is uh, going to be um, Apache Arrow, which is also a format specifically designed for dealing with columnar data. Um, and as I said, that will be a follow-up. Michael raises his hand. I apologize. I don't want to monopolize it, but I, I do have one no, last please. question. Uh, um, do you foresee any issues, or, or maybe it is not an issue, but I'd, I'd be interested in uh, this kind of compaction. I, I do remember back in, I don't know, 2013, whatever, I used to work at MapR, and HBase was one of the things where there were these compaction issues where you know it's kind of like garbage collect, right? You need to uh, reshuffle stuff and, and make sure that, that you're still staying effective. Um, and yeah, does that in, in your setup happen or can it not happen? And, and if not, then why not? Yeah, so um, it, it, compaction is definitely uh, relevant. Um, it, it is, however, uh, something that we are at least currently postponing until we are thinking about persistence. Everything that we've talked about today is entirely in memory. Gotcha. Um, okay. So we can actually reshuffle the data very efficiently in memory. And there's essentially going to be a, um, let's call it a retention period or something like that um, of how much data is going to be kept in the in memory block. And the way that we envision this to work is either size-based or time-based, probably size-based, because it's just so much easier to um, reason about. Uh, also, a lesson learned from <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I was just about to say yes. Um, mm -hmm. And because of the like columnar layout, we're actually paying for each line the same. So we're not, we're not uh, you know, in Prometheus, we wanted to keep series constant, right? But here, actually, the thing that we're paying for is a row. But each row is, at least on average, equally expensive. And so doing the size base is actually just as good as uh, being time-based. So time-based is really just if people have a very specific reason why they want it to be time-based. Uh, really, for, for us, we foresee that um, uh, size base is going to be the, the thing that people use. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I can already kind of foreshadow what we've been thinking about in persistence. And I think it's not all that wild, given that we're looking at the Apache Arrow project for um, querying this data. Uh, we're very interested in using Apache Parquet um, for the persistent format, which hopefully um, kind of extends that interoperability aspect that we're striving for even more with open standards. Um, so. 
basically the the ingestion of data is going to be the pprof format right an open format um, the query layer uses apache arrow also an open format that other things could plug into persistence is going to be um, apache parquet also an open format and you, you see the the pattern um, something that um, we haven't completely decided on and i think this is all, only only experience is going to tell we have been thinking that potentially it makes sense to have an intermediary format between um, this in-memory format that we have and Apache Parquet, um, just because we could pretty efficiently serialize the data in memory on already and just dump it to to disk um, and then you know memory map it or some some similar strategy, um, and but but that would be unlikely that we can do that in memory in the format that the parquet um, mm. specification uh, requires and then we would essentially at at the first compaction we would then convert it into uh, parquet mm. format at least that's you know some very uh, raw thoughts that uh, have been going through our heads definitely something that we need to flesh out much more um, right. yeah. And why parquet and not org? Or like, you know, did you make a, an intentional decision? Why? I think primarily it's the it's the closeness of the Apache Arrow project. Um, okay, makes sense. Just just because there there are so many um, projects out there, or like the official <laughs> parquet and Arrow um, libraries even do the conversion between the two formats, mm, um, and sense. the interoperability just feels right uh, in terms of open standards but really we we haven't made a um a strong decision we we actually first wanted to see if we can do parquet or arrow for the in-memory database even as well but um just uh, like back of the envelope uh, calculation showed that it's just completely not feasible not to have any um any like compression or in, uh, optimized encoding for the in-memory um, database, which would be how the Apache Arrow um, format would be. And Parquet we can't do because we would need to re-serialize all the data every time we insert something. And so that's also not going to be workable. Um, actually, I think this is a great thing to um, add to the, to the RFC. We should go back and um, add that. Let me take a note for that. I think that's in general the case, right? To be very, very explicit about what is in scope and what is not, because currently, like you mentioned, a couple of things there, Frederick, right? Saying like, look, this is only um, in memory. This is not about persistency per se, the, the, the initial at least. Um, and maybe going a step further, saying like, well, that means if you, you know, restart the server, the data is gone, as far as I understand it, right? So. Being very, very clear in what's in scope and not in scope at the very beginning uh, is great because I think currently it's mainly in, in your head, the, the head of the folks who have been working on that internally, um, but it might not be clear to everyone, uh, maybe you know, after watching that, that recording, but having it in the dark is you know, probably a good idea to be very explicit about it. I, I took a note about that. I'll make sure that we specify that more clearly in the RFC um, and the back of envelope. Okay, that's it for today. Um, any, any other questions, comments? All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, Frederick, for this uh, detailed uh, presentation of the new columnar chart uh, and Michael for the questions. Uh, the next topic on our agenda is actually a request from the community. I guess Manoj also initialized the idea. Uh, he wants to know uh, uh, more about the CI and build tooling setup that we have in the Parka. Uh, so he wants to get a high level walkthrough. We have a couple of maintainers here. Uh, we haven't actually decided like who is going to do this, but uh, maybe if uh, 
Manoj, if you can just like clarify the what is the specific things that you need to uh, know about, uh, like any of the maintainers can jump in and explain further. Yeah, Kamal, uh, I was I was more in, interested uh, in, in how the uh, the the protobuf files are getting generated. Um, mainly the uh, the the protobuf files for uh, the the front end. Uh, project basically i was i was trying to uh, dig into the code base to find that and and i was not able to so that that's when i i realized like um i uh, more of the tooling side of things were a bit off for me so that that's why i raised that question yeah that's a cool. that's a that's a good question um Kemal, do you wanna no please go ahead that? or Mat matthias all right um, so um, essentially, we use the the buff tool um, for generating anything related to um, protobuf. So uh, let me let me just pull it up and share the link to the file. Um, there are a couple of files throughout the repo that define that um, work that needs to be done. So the first, the kind of entry point for this is this file um, that essentially defines where buff searches for the protobuf um, definitions. And then what ends up being generated is declared in this um, configuration file that lays uh, just next to it. Um, and then within that file, there is the there's line number 16 to um 24 which um the the first one the name the one that's named javascript is responsible for generating just the protobuf messages and then there is um the other one the one that's uh, named uh, typescript ts um, that's the one that also generates the grpc web um kind of clients and stubs uh, for JavaScript to use. So let me also drop that in the chat just to make sure that also the, the line numbers are recorded here. Um, and then ultimately that, um, this is all the configuration for buff. And then the actual call in CI that's done is the proto generate make target, which you can find on from line number 64 to 69 um, in the make file. So that's essentially everything related to protobuf generation. Does that clear things up or um, are there yeah, still yeah, yeah, missing pieces? Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah I, I somehow missed the YAML files, but yeah. <laughs> thanks so much for that. OK, great. Awesome. Anything else in, in re regards to uh, CI setup that's not, not clear? Um, I think I'm, I'm good for now. Yeah, I wanted to in, in inject here for a bit, and maybe you can just quickly um, summarize what buff is for the audience, because I think it's still pretty new. And previously, we had like scripts, but why? Like, what, what makes buff great, and why did we choose it? Why did we use it? Yeah, very good, very good point. So um, essentially, before the buff tool, and as Matthias said, buff is still a pretty, pretty recent, pretty new tool. Um, we we just used to use a um, tool called uh, Proto C, uh, the Proto compiler, which had a plugin ar architecture where you could um, write commands that would use the plugins to generate code. Um, and it was incredibly pluggable, but it turned out that we, that every project, um, that at least we've interacted with, um, ended up copying or writing, uh, scripts with hundreds of lines of code, um, and did kind of random string replacements in them. And so it just kind of all started, uh, to get too complicated, which is why the buff people, um, wanted to kind of 
attempt a new a fresh start of uh, protobuf tooling because they really like the um, serialization format and everything, but the tooling was kind of lacking. And so this is trying to uh, to fix that problem. Anything to add to Kemal or Matthias? I just want to add that we actually have a blog post on this topic, which I already included in the uh, document. And I'm also adding to the messages. Like It's like more brief than uh, Frederick already explained, but I'm sure it could help you. Yep. And, and also adding to, to this, um, I think what Buff really kind of like improved next to like ha not having so many scripts anymore in the repository itself is not having to copy around all these like proto files and not knowing which version they are. And like, it was just like literally copying files around. Um, so they also set up this kind of like uh, a registry, almost like NPM or um, like a container registry, uh, not really container registry maybe, but like, yeah, NPM or uh, Go modules, et cetera, or crates in Rust, um, where you can now pull different uh, protofile definitions and I, I link to the Google APIs for example and I think like every every like every other project uses these um at least like for timestamps for example they they are widely used and yeah it's just great for uh, readability discoverability and also not to um copy around files and and making sure things are kind of like staying up to date etc so yeah is great so far yeah i was just gonna say general shout out and uh there's a lot more functionality uh to the buff tooling that we, than we can possibly cover here um so go do, I, I highly recommend checking out their documentation yep they they have a, a great uh ecosystem as michael just pointed out That's super easy to install Great. Uh, thanks for the explanation, everyone. Uh, Manoj, do you have any other specific questions? Um, no, Kamal, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. OK, great. Thanks for, again, asking this question. And yeah, I guess we have uh, gone through all the agenda items. Uh, anyone else has anything, some ad hoc questions or topics we want to discuss? Yeah, Ben, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, I have another question about the coronary storage. So uh, I think the a lot of uh, maybe new coronary storage have uh, built on top of the Apache Arrow and Parkway projects, such as uh, the next generation of InfluxDB. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's next generation. So have you considered maybe using it uh, in Parker or yeah, success. Yeah, great, great question. So actually, um, a lot of um, what we're thinking of building has been inspired by Influx IOX. Um, and as I said, um, a really big uh, driver for building a storage is that we can have this experience where the, the storage is entirely built in. Um, that said, also, uh, we are meeting with the Influx IOX team to discuss this um, this further. So it's possible that there may be a collaboration, but it's unclear at this point. We haven't spoken with them um, in person uh, about this yet. Um, and as I said, it's quite possible that maybe the Polar Signals um, service might end up using something like that. But um, it's unlikely because it's written in, in Rust and it's not intended to be an embeddable storage, um, it, it's unlikely that the Parka project will ship with it. But um, I like I personally wouldn't be opposed to having it be one of the storage backends that Parka might uh, support. So that's something that I think we can we can discuss. But yeah, a, a lot of uh, what we've thought about um, was inspired by Influx IOX. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I have another question about the 
like the use case. So as a user of Parker, so I usually just look at the single profile instead of using the fancy merging or diffing features. So uh, as I understand so far, so the corner storage would benefit a lot for like a lot of maybe profiles merging together because that's what a corner storage is good at. So for my use case of just the retrieving a single uh, profile, is it also like benefit from corner storage? So it, it's unlikely to um, you know change in terms of the query characteristics uh, for that use case. Um, the the way that we're sorting um, the data in this columnar layout is quite intentionally um, kind of a trade-off be between all of the query patterns. So um, yeah, it, it's essentially you're right. It is to make um merging profiles much faster whilst while selecting single profiles is still possible and reasonably fast so yeah for for your use case things are unlikely to ch to change um with the exception that storage is hopefully going to uh end up being much more much more stable as we go further down this path with persistence and so on because as you know right now it's also just in memory yeah, and like adding adding to that, um, I think especially querying for subtree like sub flame graphs or whatever you want to call them, like just like like a specific function in all of its uh, children, basically, and then having those merged across an hour a day or whatever. Like this is exactly what is going to vastly improve. Um, we could probably build something with like the current TSDB where we like have a series and then we like only read the specific chunks. Um, but then we kind of lose all the concurrency, um, not really lose the concurrency, but I think like the, the processing as Frederick mentioned a couple of times is not gonna be as, um, perfect for the way cpus are architected um so yeah like not only merging will improve um but even like further and more complicated query patterns will also likely improve down the road at least that's <laughs> that's the premise that we're building all of this on right so yeah yeah I, I do want to emphasize your use case will be just as well supported as it is today you are still going to continue to be able to to do to use Parker in exactly the way that you uh, just mentioned. Okay, so that would be great. Thank you, Frederick and uh, Matthias. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, then uh, we can give everybody's time back. Uh, thanks for attending today to Park Office Hours. You can also find the previous uh, Office Hours recordings in our YouTube channel, uh, all the links in our uh, shared uh, Community Office Hour document. And for the further discussions, uh, please go ahead and join our Discord channel. And we are, uh, all of the maintainers are there and we will be uh, responsive uh, with your questions as well. That being said, uh, thanks everyone for attending and Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.